Hey guys, in this video we're going to look at the Lesson 7 uh, demos, which is about client and server validations. This maps to the ninth chapter of your book, and chapter 9, which is a pretty short chapter. You're learning about various different aspects of ASP.NET's built-in validation controls. The author starts off talking about why you would care, and then drills down into what the controls are. As you can see, there's only a few of them, and we're going to take a look at demonstrations on each. A couple things to note is that all these controls have both a server side and client side aspect, and um, that's actually important. The author talks about HTML5 having built-in validation as well. However, most aspects of the HTML5 doesn't actually work with the ASP.NET validation tools, at least not in real meaningful ways. So while you can use it, very, there's very limited support for ASP.NET. For example, um, the text mode is supported as far as identifying that something as a number. However, you may end up with situations where, as he puts it, the, the messages being demonstrated are kind of conflicting. So here it says, please enter an email address. That's with HTML5's nice little pop-up box. However, the ASP.NET validation is just telling you that you're missing a at symbol. It's a little bit more detailed. So anyway, um, the author's recommendation is for the most web forms that you're using, just kind of use the ASP.NET validation and wait till things mature with the HTML5. Now, using the validation controls are pretty simple. There's a few things that you want to set, like the control that you want to validate just binds it to a particular text box or other tools. Um, is valid indicates that you have successfully passed a validation and the page can then uh, be reported as being valid once all the controls are valid. Also, uh, by default, it is true that JavaScript will be generated for you. This uh, JavaScript validation will be automatically written for you and then uh, the client-side validation will fire before the server-side does. So those are very important settings, and we'll see some examples. The, um, the first example I want to take a look at is just kind of some basic stuff. Here's an example of something that doesn't get much simpler, just a simple order form, in which case I have a, a couple text boxes that I'm going to, to work with. <clears throat> if I come over here and look at it, when I open this up in a browser, I've got two text boxes. If I put in nothing, the required field validator is fire. If I do put in something, the required field validator no longer fires. If I put in a quantity, then I'm clear and it can move on. Now that's just a simple required field validator, but you can combine validation tools together. So for example, under the quantity text box, I have combined a required field validator with a comparison or compare validator. And what the compare validator does, in this case, it just checks to see if it's an integer. So now I have a layer of validation. It's not enough for it to just have some data. It must actually have a quantity that's legitimate. In this case, legitimacy is defined as just being an integer. Uh, have, you have to be careful though. It's true that this works, but it also is true that this works as well. So you may need an additional layer of validation uh, on top of this to control negative values. Validations can uh, be configured, validators can be configured in the property sheet as well as by typing in things in text. So, for example, here I have the control to validate. And if I scroll down a little further, I can see the type is set to integer. The operator 
controls what type of comparison is going to go on. In this case, I could make it so that in addition to it just being a data type check, I could make it so that it's greater than or less than a particular number. Now, not only is it an integer, but it has to be greater than zero. Query field validators. Invalid quantity. Still invalid quality. That's all right. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you can configure these either in layers. If the layer that you're working with does not satisfy your needs, just add another layer of validation. Uh, in this case, I was able to just modify it with the operator and uh, change that over from just a simple data type check to include the operator as well. Couple things to note when you're setting the um, the validation tools up. The original way that ASP.NET wrote the client side JavaScript was just to, to create some dynamic HTML using a combination of JavaScript and references to the document object model of the browser. Later on, uh, Microsoft also included the ability to go through and uh, connect to jQuery and make calls to various different jQuery functions. Now, if you get an error message like this, unobtrusive validation mode requires a, um, a script reference mapping to jQuery. And I did not include a script call to a jQuery library. Then the option you have is either A, add a script mapping to the jQuery library, or B, just turn that feature off. Now, if you had been using ASP.NET uh, a few versions ago, you would not have seen this. It's easy to remedy, though. Uh, you either, again, make a, a reference, or you go to the web config file, and you add in this setting. In my example, I didn't get that error message because I added that setting to the web config file. What I did is I set it to none. This means that it will not try to use the JavaScript, Come on, let's see if we can get an IntelliSense to pop here. Okay, well, I'll leave it at none. And uh, I'll take this key out. This is the same form as we had previously. I'll go ahead and run it. And you can see I get that unobtrusive validation mode required. i go back to the web config file and I'll place it back in, save my work, and now it goes away. Uh, another thing that you should know about is the, um, if you're using Internet Explorer, Visual Studio 2012, uh, 2013 ties back into Visual, uh, IE ties back into Visual Studio 2012 using this browser link. And what it does, it helps you with different debugging aspects. However, you can get a client-side validation error message uh, when uh, client-side JavaScript error message, I should say, that certain things don't work. And this actually only happens in IE. Um, but that makes sense because it has to do with a implicit connection between Internet Explorer and Visual Studio. So if you get that message, just disable that while you're using the, the validation tools here. It's not really going to, to harm you per se, but it is rather annoying. If you go through and it will still work. But as you can see, 
it just pops up on occasion and you just have to say no anyway to avoid that just go through and disable the, the link there and you'll be you'll be fine <clears throat> If you haven't done so, go ahead and uh, play with the validation tools and those options I've just set up or just told you about uh, by just going through and creating a, a simple web page, add a text box, and add in the required field validator and comparison validator, and then configure the web config file and disable and enable the Visual Studio uh, browser link and see if all those messages come up and they kind of kind of solidify your understanding of how those work. I'll go ahead and pause the video at this point and let you take a few minutes to do that. Okay, now that you've uh, had a chance to kind of play with the validation uh, controls and work with them, let's, uh, let's drill down into some examples of how they might work. The required field validator is by far probably the easiest one you're gonna set up. But there's a couple little options that are nice to know about. One of them is the ability to go through and put an image uh, <coughs> instead of just text. <clears throat> now, it's not either or. You can actually have both. But in this example, all I've done was, instead of the text, I've gone through and put an HTML element in here. Remember that the, the way this works is, it's going to generate HTML uh, div or span as far as the text message. I believe it's a span. We can take a look at it here in a second. If you would like to modify that, you certainly can. You can just go through and add in some other HTML, including things like adding a style tag to um, a style tag to the text. And the, the key thing is just replace the text that you would normally have. It'll create a span and, and put the item in. In this case, I've added an image. Uh, I just went to um, paint created a little GIF file and then referenced that in my uh, project. So here's an example. So here's my little GIF. It's not exactly fancy. And I made it in paint. I didn't make it here. At least I don't remember making it here. I think I made it in paint. And then um, <clears throat> all you have to do is if you want a reference to it, you can drag it in. It'll give you the, the source. And in my case, I just went through and I added that instead of the text. I have the alternate text that so shows up when somebody hovers over it. First name is required is from the alternate text. So it's a nice feature. Um, let me take a look at this view source. And you can see here that the text that was output let's see where is that required right here is in a span. So this is still in a span. It's the same type of layout, but I've added on a non-breaking space and then uh, the actual image tag. So it just inserts it right in there in addition to the span that would normally be created. You can see that this is the text that would be typed in. Well, I've just put that text in here. So again, you can, you can adjust this. Now the fact that it makes a span means it's not a block item for those who are used to working with CSS, etc. So you'll have to, in order for it to be a valid um, XHTML doc, you'd have to use something that would work as inline. I don't remember there being a configuration. I'm going to go ahead and look at the property sheet and see if there is. Let's see, anything about converting it to um, from block Oh, excuse me, um, inline to block, or in other words, from a span to a div. 
Control Style, Controller Validate, CSS Class. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything, guys. Of course, you see me do it sometimes. I'll look right here. I'm looking right at it, and I can't see it. But at this point in time, I don't. I don't see anything in there. I guess I could do a search on the internet, but. Um, if that is a big deal to you, make sure that you only put in inline items within there. Not much more to say about that. Pretty straightforward. Uh, there is another aspect on this demo that uh, is kind of nice. One is the ability to set the focus on the control causing the error. So this is a nice to have feature. And let me demonstrate what it does. So <clears throat> here, I've got a required field validator, and this is a required field validator also, but I put something in the text box for last name. When I hit submit, watch the cursor. It jumps up to the control that caused the invalid uh, validation. Now, once again, I'm on the second text box. I've taken out the value. I hit submit, and you can see that it goes to the first one in the list. So it, if I have something there, submit, it jumps down to the second one because the first one is valid. Anyway, it's a nice to have feature. It's the set focus on error feature. Uh, by default, it's turned off, but if you turn it to true, it will do that. That's an, a nice feature. Try, um, take a few minutes to try out those on a text box. Just set up a, a text box, do the demo like I did, and try both the set focus on error and the feature for adding an image. Again, if you want to make your own custom image, that's fine. You can copy it, uh, my image, and use it. The way I made it was I just went to uh, paint, made an image, and used that for my example. And of course, in real life, you could make more professional images, but just make something to prove that it works. Go ahead, I'll pause the video and let you take, uh, let's say take 10 minutes or so and, and try that out. Well, now that you've had a chance to, to mess around with the uh, required field validator, let's talk about another kind of feature that's pretty handy. It's um, the validation group option. And where this comes in handy is if you have a situation where you want to show what looks like multiple forms on a uh, ASP.NET page, you may have kind of a, an issue with that because uh, ASP.NET only allows a single server-based form on a page. Now, HTML, you can have multiple uh, forms, but um, those are the client-side HTML forms, not the server-side run-at-server forms, those ASP.NET forms. However, it turns out that you can kind of get around that by going through and setting up uh, validation uh, groups. So here I have what looks like two different forms. One is the you know registering for a, a new name, uh, registering to be a, a new user on the website, very much like your project where you had the, the login registration piece and the actual login page. And I've combined them here onto a single page. Now, the way I'm going to work this is I don't want to have the validation fire in the registration piece if a text box in the login piece is empty, and vice versa. So we avoid that by setting up these validation groups. And here's how it works. You take a validator control, required field validator control. You assign it a made-up name, validation group made-up name. And then when you associate the button, you tie it into that. Now, when somebody clicks on the little button, the submit button, it will only cause validation for controls that are belong to the same group because this text box username and this text box password actually belong to the same group only they will be validated when you hit a button in that section to make it uh, look like I did here I added what's called a uh, frame set and let me show you how that works uh, set frame set, sorry, field set. 
The field set starts here. The legend is what shows up in that little border as text. It's a nice feature. And then um, I've gone through and set the login group for the button and the two text boxes in one field set. There's the beginning of the other. Now the end of it is right here. This is the second field set. This is my registration one. And once again, I made up a name. I called it register group. And I set the two text boxes and the button to all be bound to that. So what you end up with is a single form, but it's been divided in two different sections. So to make it look even prettier, I went ahead and added on a CSS type to change the background color and added a column, etc. So that way I could just go through and make a couple different columns out of my divs. In the end, what I get is a page like this. see that ASP.NET automatically moves things around depending on the browser window. It's, it's a nice piece of software, guys. Very easy to use. And now if I hit the login over here, because I don't have anything in this form, the required field validator is fired up. But over on the registration side, it's not actually invoked at all. Doing something here, it will still submit everything but only the, val the validation only happens on this side. Everything will be submitted though, so you'll get a couple blanks on these guys. If I come over here and click on that, you notice that it has no impact on the uh, validation of these text boxes, again, because it's in a different validation group. The button is tied to the same validation group as these text boxes. So it's a, it's a nice feature not very difficult to implement. Um, the logic would be go through and see if the when the button is clicked, uh, if everything has been validated. Now the whole page will be considered valid if all the button's group members are valid. Normally, when you ask for the page is valid property, it'll only return true if everything on all the validators have been recorded or are set to being valid in and of themselves. Now, in this case, because I'm using validation groups, the page is considered valid if the items in the group are valid, not everything on the page, and that's important. And that's all done for you automatically. So it's a it's a it's a nice feature. I would recommend playing with this. In fact, the easiest way to to do this is take a little bit of time now to go ahead and steal some code from your project and try merging the two pages, the registration page and login page into one. You can use my code and your code, merge them all together to come up with uh, something similar to this with the, the simple required validator. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video and let you go ahead and t uh, try that out. It'll probably take about 15, maybe 20 minutes to get all those pages together, but give it a shot. Um, I think you'll find that this is uh, really uh, a nice feature to know about. Now that you've had a chance to play with the validation groups, let's move on to uh, another thing you should know about. It's the option of setting the cause validation attribute to false. And here's the reason why you'd want to do that. Occasionally what happens is that you end up creating a web page where you have like a submit or cancel button. A typical time this would happen would be if you have an order page of some type where you want to, you thought you were going to order something but you decided to cancel. The only problem is, is that if the default setting is uh, enabled, hitting the cancel will invoke the validation tools and uh, controls. And when they, uh, when they get invoked, you'll get uh, a message saying that you can't cancel because the first name is required. And let me demonstrate it so you can see what I mean. So nothing's in there. I'm on this page. I decide that, oh, I'm not really ready to check out yet. 
to hit cancel. Oops, I've messed it. <laughs> I forgot to uh, set it back to the default behavior. In fact, let me prove it's a default by removing that. And you can see that it fires up as required. Now, that's annoying. It's not the end of the world because you could actually just go through and, and follow like the, the breadcrumb link if you had one up here and it will take you out. Or they could actually go through and if I'm on that page and I click on a link to bring me to the, the, this form here, I could hit the back button and that will get me out as well. And you've probably seen this behavior on a, a time or two where you, know, you click that and it says, wait a second, you're required to fill it in just to cancel? That that's just seems unprofessional. Well, the way to resolve it is simply on the cancel button itself, go through and add in this property, this um, attribute. Set the cause validation to false. And when that is set, it won't behave like that. It'll actually go through and when you hit cancel, it will perform whatever action that you tell it to uh, without invoking validation. Now, in this case, what I told it to do was when you click on the cancel button, redirect back to the default page. So that's why it's going back there. There's no magic happening. Uh, it's actually explicitly told to go back there to that page. But a couple of things to note is that the button, I never actually bound it to anything. There's nothing, no binding at all in the button's code that would you know tie it directly into the validation and that's true of both buttons both the submit button and the cancel button these are identical this one has a, a method associated with a click event that's true but other than that guys it's it's identical i just added these these items in here to cause it to perform the actions i wanted so whenever you put a button on the form Remember that if you do not want it to invoke validation, configure it so it does not. Let's look at the uh, require uh, the range validator. Range validator is also handy. It works with numeric data types, alphabetic data types, and date data types. Uh, you can go ahead and specify some kind of range. So, for example, I have here, um, I want a minimum of 18 and a maximum of 100. And just like all the other validators, it's going to go ahead and display a text there. Or it could be image um, when it's not valid. Now, in this case, the whole page will has to be valid. All the input, all the validators have to report valid because I do not have a group assigned. And that's the normal behavior. But if it is valid, if all the fields are valid, then response.right will just show it as being valid, which of course is just used for testing. Here, the range validator, I've gone through and configured it. Now let's see, I had it at five originally. I really wanted 18. I'm gonna change that and save my work. It makes more sense because that's usually like the target you're shooting for. And then, um, when I put something invalid in there, it'll show the text. It doesn't really get much more simple than that. You notice in this case, it is indeed bound to the text box. So I go through here and let me kick it off. Nothing there, required field validator. I've actually stacked that one on just to show um, I recorded this video unfortunately twice because the sound was off on the first one. So uh, I had to do this again. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the default behavior as per the code in the um, the code in the Word document is this. If you put nothing in there, it will come back as being valid because nothing is being checked as far as allowing a, a blank value. Blank values are allowed by default. The page is still valid. What will not make it valid is if I put in a number that is lower than 18 or higher than 100. If I put in something that is within that range, though, it's valid again. Interesting that the 
uh, validity still shows up in response to that right. That's bizarre. I should have had it wiped out. Anyway, that's why I would recommend just stacking on, um, in this case, a required field validator. And it's pretty easy. You just drag it, drop it in, and just make it a part of that. Oh, I put it in the wrong spot. Let me drag it to the end here and add it on beneath it. I have to do this so that it shows up well in like Word or in uh, the videos, but of course it doesn't really matter as far as how it runs. Just trying to make it look nice. I don't know why I even need that second tag there. Not doing anything with it, so I'll close that off. Or maybe not. Require field error message. Require field error. Huh. Control. Oh, sorry guys. Control to validate. I forgot to set that. Property is control to validate. Hmm. I thought the drop down box would come up there, but it didn't. Okay, TXTH. And now I should be able to do this. You happy now? It is. Now you can see that the um, the complexity of what it's looking for, as far as like if you have a number less than three, you still get the same error message as you would if you have text in there. If you would like something more customized, as far as that goes, again you need to layer things, or you can even, as I'll show you in just a few minutes, go through and make your own custom functions. The comparison validator or compare validator allows you to go through and compare two different input controls and see if the values match or have what, what the relationship is between those values. It doesn't have to match, it just has to um, define a particular re relationship. In my example, I think this is kind of a classic, I have a start date and an end date. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the end date is further in the future than the start date, which only makes sense. So if it's not, I'm going to give a, an error message of some type. The key things to look at here, and as you can see this code is very small, is that the control to validate is the end date. That's the one that I need to be greater than. The control to compare would be start date. Let's take a look at it in real life here. Okay. You put nothing in there, I don't have a required field validator, so it comes up as valid. But if I do put values in, if I put a value of one for the date and two uh, for the end date and two for the start date, I get an error, error message. If on the other hand, I go ahead and I put in three, and it's fine. So it works as expected. There's a couple other things that are unexpected. Let's see here. How about two and one? I'm not getting an error message there, but I'm also not getting a very clear error message about what the issue is. And if you notice, I'm not getting anything up on top. So, once again, if I want more customizable error messages, I need to kind of look at something either by layering on additional uh, validators or going through and adding in some kind of customization. The operator in this particular tool is really important. Uh, there's a couple different settings. Let's see, where is my operator? Right here. You can choose things like equal to, 
greater than, data type check, less than or equal to, not equal, etc. Um, and then you can see that there's a validation group here too. All these controls should have that. So that's uh, this is configurable. Basically, you're just comparing one input to another instead of a hard-coded value, like the, the value comparison. Rick's expression validators are much more customizable as far as what you're exactly looking for. However, um, regular expressions can be kind of confusing. I don't work with regular expressions enough that I remember all the symbols, and that's kind of the, the issue. Let me pause it while the, the gardener goes by. Okay, now it's a little quieter. Here we go. So, um, Regular expression support is kind of cool. What you do is you put in a pattern and then it has to match a, a complex pattern in order for it to be, be valid. However, you have to come up with a pattern yourself. So an example would be I want a wide string, in other words, Unicode character, and you have to have at least one of those. And after that, it's followed by a um, a set of values including a negative, a positive, a dot, or a single quote, apostrophe, followed by one or more characters. And you can repeat that uh, as many times as you want. Usually the star means zero or more times. I don't think it does in this particular case. Uh, and then you have to have an actual uh, hard-coded at symbol followed by more characters, usually with a dot, and eventually end up with you know some other um, some other domain name at some point. Now, if I work with these on a regular basis for a couple weeks, I get better at them. But I've never they've never been my favorite thing to do. So what I usually have to do is I have to to go out and look on the internet to find these expression strings. And um, if I'm looking for something like, I don't know, phone number. I'll just go through and put in a search there and see if I can find something. Now the cool thing is, you can get a lot of free code on the internet. The bad news is, not all of it is 100% great. It is really up to you to go through and validate the free code that you're, you're getting. So that's, that's an issue. You can use some tools though. Um, you may have seen that there is a couple little validator, validation tools here. And there's also some tools out there, there's a lot of them actually, that can help you uh, go through and create uh, regular expressions. Um, I've used Regex Buddy a number of years. It works all right. Basically what it does is it allows you to go through and type in your expression and then test it or type in uh, something over here and then go ahead and generate one and then you can switch back and forth and do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, if you're planning on doing a lot of heavy validation, a tool like this, it doesn't have to be this one, uh, may be you know, valuable to you. But there's a number of tools on the internet now that's uh, available to use. Anyway, once you have figured out your, your expression that you want to work with, you place it in there and then when you try to run that code, if they don't match that pattern, you get an error message.
No required field validator. Okay. Invalid email address. Let's see if I match the pattern. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pause again for the gardeners to go by. Well, you know, they could be out there for a while. I'll just continue, actually. Um, <clears throat> what happens is that it goes through and checks a pattern, but of course, it may well be that this is still an invalid email address. It, you know, there, you have to come up with some other mechanism, such as sending them an email and then waiting for them to send back a reply in order to make sure it's valid. And you've certainly seen that out there on the internet when you're doing things. But uh, you can at least test that it follows a particular pattern. And of course, they will make client-side code as well whenever you do this. It'll create the, the client-side code, and you'll see in that some JavaScript will be created to, to go through and work with it. And that's because um, Microsoft is automatic, their control is automatically making the JavaScript. And so the block will be created for you, and I'll do both client-side and server-side validation before it actually gets passed as being valid. Now, if none of those actually work well for you, you still got another option yet to go, and that's the custom validator. In the custom validator, you are allowed to go through and create... Uh, custom functions, JavaScript functions and server-side functions, and then just have them called by configuring the on-server validate and client validation function attributes, and just point them to the actual functions you want to run. Let's take a, a look at that in my demo. So. This um, server-side validation, I go through and it's using C-sharp. It's going to have the type here. .NET's going to pass over a compatible type into arguments, at which point I can pick up the value or set or get the is valid form. Our form property. In this case, I'm going to check to see if it's true that the length of the value they sent me is less than 10. If it's less than 10, I'm going to say that it is not valid. I'm going to indicate that this is not valid. And if this is set to not valid, then when you ask later on in like a page load or whatever, if the page is valid, the answer will be no, because you have sent back a uh, invalid uh, setting from one of the constituent controls, uh, the uh, components that make up the page. If, however, it matches that, I'll set it to true. And it is doing both uh, client side and server side. The client side will run first. Uh, you'll notice that it's almost the same, but of course, in uh, Microsoft's server side code, or client side code, I'm so sorry, it's JavaScript, and as such, it's not strongly typed. So um, you don't actually put a type here. You'll just go ahead and implicitly pa pass that over and type it for you, at which point you'll still be able to pull out the same code, though. It's the same object. It's, uh, it's just uh, a similar object. Uh, it's going through and um, using the same properties, so you can do the exact same thing. Now, in my case, I went ahead and set the, the length to 5 on the client and 10 on the server. That way we can see that the... The client code runs first, but normally you would set it to uh, the same number. And when I run this, if I don't put anything in there, again, no required field. If I put in a couple of values, it comes up with a little message box saying entry must be, you know, at least five characters in length. But you'll notice that the server side code runs as well. So after that fires off, it still goes over the server side. It runs that, then comes back with this 10 more messages. And uh, let's say I make the 5. Well, that server side never fires up, but you still get an error message, you know, saying that you have to have at least 10 characters. So it's important to make sure that, <laughs> that, the, um, that the numeric values or the, the comparison is the same on both client and the server side. Otherwise, it's going to be confusing, and they will feel like you're messing with them. 
Um, but once you know you've passed that restriction, then it works just PG. Not much to talk about here, other than the fact that I've just gone through and bound those methods by putting in the on server validate and on client validation attributes. Well, guys, that's it for chapter nine. It's not a very big chapter, but I would recommend taking a look at your project code. And after you have it up and running and you're pretty much close to turning it in, you might want to think about going through and adding in these validation techniques. See if you can enhance your, your project doing so. If you don't have time for that, I understand it's not a must have, but it is a nice to have. And uh, hopefully you'll find this kind of an interesting as uh, interesting chapter to read. Please uh, do read it when you get a chance. It's a short one. It won't take you very long to do. And in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and shut down the video and I'll look forward to seeing everybody in class. Take care.